Good evening. I want to welcome you to our history, theology, and philosophy lecture meetup. Um, every Tuesday, pretty much, we have one of these on a broad variety of topics relating to history, theology, or philosophy. Uh, we're not meeting up in person during uh, the pandemic times here, but we're still uh, doing these every Tuesday via live stream. So welcome. We always begin with our mission, which is to invite everyone into community, to continually learn and grow, to abolish poverty and end suffering, to promote peace and justice, and to live life meaningfully together. Um, all of our programming is listener supported and we appreciate uh, your donations. Uh, you can always go to, there's usually links in the Facebook if you're watching us on that. And then also uh, you can always go to our website centerplace.ca and there's a big red button that says support center place. Uh, your contributions in the United States and Canada are tax deductible. And so we're very, um, very pleased that uh, for all the support we've been getting. Thank you so much. Um, next week, our lecture is going to be on Latter-day Saint history. Uh, and specifically, we're going to do origins through 1860, so it's kind of the early period. And um, part of that is that across uh, uh, Community of Christ, um, people are doing e-camping. And so um, because they aren't actually going to summer camps, they are uh, you know, doing all kinds of different meetups. And so we decided we would coordinate um, our next two weeks with topics that would be of special interest to those groups. But hopefully they're also, um, it'll be some background information that will also be very interesting to um, our regular Tuesday group viewers. Our topic tonight is the rise and fall of Manichaeism. So we might ask ourselves, <laughs> this is a fairly obscure topic. So what is Manichaeism and who was Mani, the prophet of the Manichaeans? If we're looking at it from the perspective in the West, um, what Manichaeism, if you've heard of it, it may be especially remembered as a great heresy. Uh, and Mani was uh, named a uh, heresiarch, which is to say an arch heretic um, by Christians uh, who um, were very much anti Manny and anti Manichaean. And so, uh, an early Christian uh, writer, uh, Eusebius, a uh, very early uh, historian of Christ early Christianity, uh, wrote about uh, Manny, and he said in his text, there was a certain madman. Uh, Manny's, and um, and so he's writing in Greek and Manny, even though uh, his name is actually probably either Semitic or Persian in origin, it it sounds like the Greek word mania, which is to say means madness, and so um, Eusebius is using that pun. Manny's, as he was called, well agreeing with his name for his demoniacal heresy, armed himself by the perversion of his reason and at the instruction of Satan to the destruction of many. He was a barbarian in his life, both in speech and conduct, but in his nature as one possessed and insane. Accordingly, Eusebius continues, Manny attempted to form himself into a Christ. So he's trying to say he's another Messiah. Um, and then he proclaimed himself to be the very paraclete, uh, which is uh, the comforter, uh, the, uh, the Holy Spirit that Jesus in the New Testament promised that he would send to um, uh, the people and so uh, to follow him. And so what Manny says here, according to Eusebius, is that he's actually that Holy Spirit, the incarnation of that Holy Spirit. Uh, and with all this was greatly puffed up with his madness. <laughs> So you can see that uh, Eusebius is fairly uh, negative. <laughs> and unfortunately, um, a lot of our uh, sources on Manichaeism uh, everywhere um, are these kind of negative sources. So both in the West and then also uh, it, as it spread all the way across, it was spread all the way across from, from what's now France to China. 
um, and the Chinese sources are also quite hostile, as are uh, the Muslim sources. Um, so actually, I, uh, there's a little more quote here from Eusebius. Then, as if he were Christ, uh, Manny selected 12 disciples, the partners of his new religion, and after patching together false and ungodly doctrines collected from a thousand heresies long since extinct, he swept them off like a deadly poison from Persia upon this part of the world, hence the impious name of the Manichaeans spreading among many even to the present day. So, in other words, this is still uh, a very active alternate religion um, to Christianity in right like at the beginning of the fourth century. Um, and in fact, it's, it's actually quite widespread in the Roman Empire um, in that time period. Prior to um, his conversion to become a Christian, uh, St. Augustine had been a Manichaean, and so he's, in the West anyway, certainly the most famous uh, person who was temporarily anyway a Manichaean. Um, one of the problems that uh, Augustine had though when he actually met uh, a, a Manichaean bishop, he found the guy to be uh, not intellectually uh, didn't have enough chops for Augustine who felt like uh, there was not enough substance to the religion. If he'd found a better um, and a more intellectually grounded uh, uh, teacher, that might have been a very different. So the, the way that he found St. Ambrose, uh, the Bishop of Milan, who uh, was able to uh, ground Christianity within, intellectu within an intellectual tradition for Augustine. So because of Augustine's experience and the fact that he wrote about the Manichees and he wrote about all against all of their ideas and wrote tracts about why it's a heresy and why it's false, um, medieval people who read about uh, Manichees after they were extinct in the West from Augustine, uh, just, just calling anybody a Manichee was just a way of calling them a heretic. And so often um, later in the Christian West anyway, when somebody was being accused of being a heretic, they often just got called a Manichae, even though they had nothing to do with the actual religion of Manichaeism. And so, like I say, uh, it became synonymous with being not just a heretic, but a heresiarch uh, in the Christian West. Um, even before uh, the triumph of Christianity in the Roman Empire, um, uh, the pagan emperors, so Diocletian, who is the same emperor who ordered the last great persecution of the Christians at the beginning of the 4th century AD, he had also previously ordered uh, that all Manichaean leaders were to be burned alive along with all copies of their scriptures. So he was an equal opportunity persecutor. He did not like <laughs> all of these Eastern mystery religions as he saw them, and he was interested in, in, in stopping their spread if possible. And so uh, Manichaeism was seen as dangerous by Diocletian and the pagan Romans as well. After then, uh, the Emperor Constantine converted to Christianity, and Christianity slowly then became uh, the state religion of the Roman Empire under a later successor, the Emperor Theodosius. Um, Theodosius uh, decreed in 382 that all Manichaean monks within the Roman Empire should be put to death. So definitely they are seen as, as very dangerous uh, heretics or part of a religion that is not to be tolerated. So five centuries after that, just on the other side of the world, um, Manichees were also faced official persecution in Tang, China. So as part of a general campaign against foreign world religions in Tang, China, um, they even included Buddhism at the time, but especially Nestorian Christianity, the Emperor Wuzang decreed in 843 that all Manichaean clerics should be put to death. Um, and as long as we're just rounding it out in terms of all of the people who don't like the Manichees <laughs> within the uh, Dar al-Islam, within the Islamic uh, Caliphate uh, in the 8th century, the third Abbasid Caliph al-Mahdi, who is the father of the famous uh, Caliph Harun al-Rashid, he initiated a campaign uh, of inquisition against Manichaeans, who he calls again heretics, 
and all who refused to give up Manichaeism were also uh, executed. So uh, they're essentially being killed in Rome, in China, and uh, in the Islamic Caliphate in between. Okay, so who were these guys? <laughs> Obviously, these are everybody's favorite heretics from west to east, and they're viewed as dangerous enough to require persecution and even execution. Um, like I say, part of the uh, issue that we've had for a whole long time is that uh, when you are on the outs, when you are the religion that loses, um, official persecutions tend to succeed in stamping out the religion and they burn all the texts of it. And so mostly what you know about it come from these hostile sources um, like Eusebius. When I read you that text from Eusebius, that's just kind of a taste of what everybody <laughs> tends to say about the Manichees. So they are, it's very, very, very negative. If you're just busy saying how they're crazy and madmen and all this kind of thing, you aren't getting a sense of what, for example, attracted people to Manichaeism, what Mani uh, taught and what the Manichees thought of themselves. Just like though, when we found out about um, uh, Gnostics, so we had the same thing with Gnostics where pretty much we only had hostile sources until the middle of the 20th century when, as we know, in Egypt, the Nag Hammadi library was found and we suddenly recovered all of these Gnostic texts in their own, um, in their own writing, in their own presentation. Um, uh, that similarly, um, in the 20th century, Manichaean sources were recovered in Central Asia, in Iran, in Egypt, in China, uh, which allowed us to have like a much more complete picture of the religion. So, uh, Manichaeism, one of the reasons why we, this was a topic that was requested by um, a couple of folks in the group. They wanted to find out about this seemingly obscure topic, but um, it's, I think, also an interesting topic and an important topic when we do something like when we look at world religions and we do studies of comparative religion because Manichaeism is an extinct world religion. And according to the Encyclopedia Iranica, Manichaeism is the only world religion that has become completely extinct. So or probably what we mean by that is one of uh, that was so widespread and so important um, being everywhere from, as I say, what's now France to southern China and everywhere in between, and yet now is totally gone. And so we're going to look at how what it was, how it spread, and why it lost. So, um, as you can kind of just see here from the map, uh, Manichaeism is starting in, in Persia, but in the Mesopotamian part of the Persian Empire, spreads west across the Greek East and the Latin West uh, of the Roman Empire, and then across the uh, Silk Road into through Central Asia into China. So when we're talking about this being a world religion, um, world religions is one of the one of the themes as we've kind of tried to describe what was the difference between um, the older religions that went before. Um, the polytheist religions, the traditional religions like Diocletian's religion in ancient Rome, so where you have all of the the gods, Jupiter and Hera and, and, and everybody, it should be Juno actually for the Romans, so all of the, and Mars, all of these kinds of um, different polytheist gods and the temples and the sacrifice and things like that, uh, to then these other kinds of religions like um, Zoroastrianism, like Manichaeism, Christianity, Judaism, uh, Islam, Buddhism, those sort of things. So what's the difference between kind of uh, these as, as religious studies scholars try to categorize them? So in the earlier type of traditional religion, um, we ha people had this idea that there are things like divine forces, like lightning or life or love, that are anthropomorphized so that they are characterized or you think of them as human-like gods. So the same way that um, you probably can't help but think of your car as a human, you think of it as having a name and two eyes and everything like that, and a personality. Likewise, um, this is taking these kinds of forces and imagining um, them to have personalities about which you can tell 
for example, stories and myths. Um, these forces are not ethically predictable. Uh, so in other words, it's not that um, lightning or death uh, or any famine or any of these kinds of forces are, are good and are always going to do nice things or fair things or anything like that to you. Um, they're not predictable ethically like that, but they are believed to be able to be propitiated somehow. So if you do the correct rituals, if you uh, are, if you if you do things that we now think of, let's say, are superstitious, you cross your fingers, you uh, do certain bowing or other kinds of things when you cross a threshold, when you um, uh, if you've made a mistake, if you um, you know put on sackcloth and you do some kind of a ritual to purify yourself um, then you are able to essentially become ritually pure again or or propitiate the force that's involved um, generally speaking um, uh, in the roman empire especially anyway that the way uh, it functioned is that the priesthood was from the regular magistrate class uh, so they would perform rituals like sacrifice and those things um, were designed for cosmic maintenance. So and really originally, um, one of the reasons why you're performing a sacrifice is so that the sun will come back up. You're performing sacrifices in order to um, have the seasons and harvest. So you are doing things for cosmic maintenance and your main focus in this kind of religion is obedience to law through rituals, like I say, prescribed behaviors, and really, the identity and awareness is familial, tribal, or civic, as opposed to individual. So it isn't about um, you yourself as an individual um, going to heaven or something like that, but rather your clan uh, or your city or your tribe or whatever uh, your group that you are identifying with, that's who is uh, has the patron. So the patron of Athens is Athena. And so Athenians are going to carry on and you are you're part of that. And so you're part of a line of ancestors and, and so on. So as world or religions arise um, in the first uh, millennium BC, um, there's people start worrying about different things than that they'd been worrying about in these earlier traditions. So ideas arise that there is, for example, a source of order in the universe. It's not just all of these chaotic forces, but you can look up in the sky, you can start to write things down and you'll find out, hey, the seasons all recur at the same times, so all the stars move around at the same uh, way, and you are able to predict these things. Um, and the implication is that something is causing um, there's one source of all of this order. Um, people start to be concerned about individual actions, uh, and they also believe that maybe their own individual knowledge are important to that source of order or are bringing them closer to that source of order. And so out of this emerges prophets, philosophers, other religious reformers who are actually calling for ethical behavior as opposed to ritual maintenance behavior. So it's not as important that you're performing this or that sacrifice if you go and see that uh, widows are all starving to death and aren't being uh, supported. Uh, in this kind of a, a setting, individuals now are searching for meaning and they question how life should be lived and identity is increasingly individual in the ancient sense of uh, individual self-awareness and so there is this concern that starts to happen for afterlife and so people start to speculate well um, do I have a spirit that goes on will my body be resurrected uh, will I be reincarnated as someone else um, how are what's going to happen to my individual soul as opposed to just worrying about your clan uh, the way for example Abraham is just being promised that he's going to have uh, a multitude of descendants. He'll be he'll, his descendants will be a great nation. Now people would be promised, no Abraham, you're going to get to go to heaven or whatever the the new world religion is teaching. So we've talked about this. Um, it's not entirely. Uh, not everybody agrees that this is this, but it's sometimes called the axial age. And so there are multiple centers 
uh, of religious reform across the old world, and this is just some of them, uh, Zoroastrianism being one of the earliest in Persia, uh, but also, uh, for example, Jains, Buddhists in the South Asia, Confucianism, Taoism in East Asia, uh, Israelite monotheism, Greek philosophy, as people are questioning um, the old, uh, what's more, more pagan uh, way of doing things, the ritualistic, the maintenance, and are now trying to work out um, new ideas, like I say, of ethical and individual uh, uh, religious responsibility. So um, those are the ones in the map in the Axial Age are those early ones, but just because um, some of those got going early on, that doesn't stop. So obviously Christianity is a, is a later uh, adaptation. It's, a, it's, it's ultimately a fusion of um, a second temple Jewish sect with um, essentially a lot of Greek uh, over uh, connections with it. So as those, um, as those Jewish missionaries convert a bunch of Greeks, uh, then that makes sort of a, com a combination or a fusion of kind of Greek philosophy and uh, Second Temple uh, Jewish religion, and that becomes Christianity. So obviously much, much later, uh, Islam is still going to be born as a um, world religion. Uh, in between here is the prophet Manny, who was born early in the third century near Tesiphon, which is um, what was the capital of what was then the um, Parthian Empire uh, when he was born. And so uh, Tesiphon is near where um, Babylon is, it's near where, where Baghdad is now. Essentially, it's a place in the middle of Mesopotamia where you build a big capital city, but several of them, they've moved around to where they all are. So it's essentially Baghdad now. Um, but Baghdad isn't quite in the place where Tesaphon is, and neither is Babylon. So um, he would have spoken uh, Syriac. Uh, so Aramaic is a um, so kind of Syrian, and that's the language that had been the lingua franca of the old Persian Empire. And now Syriac is a, a later version of that. And he probably also spoke, he actually also spoke uh, Middle Persian. So his father, uh, Patek, was an uh, Elkasayet. <laughs> and so this is, we'll talk about what those guys are. And he was from you know, Ekbatana, so he's from Persia. His mother, Maryam, was a Parthian. So we'll talk about who all that is, his background. So when he's born, um, the Parthian Empire um, has been the successor uh, to the original, there had been an original Persian Empire that was overthrown by Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great's successors are the Hellenistic rulers of the Seleucid Empire, and you can see Seleucia there next to Tesiphon. So that had been one of the capitals of the Seleucid Empire. And then that was overthrown um, by a Iranian tribe, uh, but not Persians themselves, but they are a um, kind of a nomadic tribe of Iranians called the Parthians who uh, have this empire when um, Manny is born. And so this is a kind of an area that is straddling uh, east and west. So the Middle East is this is an early, early center, of course, of civilization. And it's also here a bridge between um, India and East Asia, farther east, so China, and uh, on, the, on the far east, and then in the west, uh, the Greek, and finally far out to the far west, the Latin um, cultures. Okay, so let's look at these kind of backgrounds of saying that um, Manny's father, uh, He's an Elkasayet, and so, um, however, I'm going to, I'm not even sure how to pronounce that, <laughs> but in any event, um, what's, who are these guys? So this is a um, Judaizing Christian sect. So uh, there are early types of Christians. There's not just one Christianity, as we've talked about, um, and one of the ways that um, people continue to be Christian, especially in uh, the East, so especially in Syria and uh, Mesopotamia, um, uh, is by continuing to um, practice and follow Jewish law. And so um, this sect we don't know too much about because, again, we don't have 
their texts. Um, we just have mainline Christian condemnations of them. And so it's probably related to the sect we've talked about called the Ebionites, which is to say a Judaizing Christian sect. So a Christian sect that um, still practices uh, Jewish law. So um, based on Manny's views, it may well be that these guys um, included docetic teachings. So their Christolo Christology is that they teach that Jesus wasn't actually ever a human being. He just appeared uh, human. And so he had the appearance of being human, but he's actually just a divine being, uh, a being of spirit. And um, they probably also, though, had Gnostic ideas. Uh, in, the, in the event, uh, Manny um, was exposed to Gnostic Christian ideas. And that is the idea that humans are redeemed through knowledge, and specifically esoteric knowledge. Um, if you are able to have what's essentially a, a Neoplatonic um, vision of how the cosmos is, is arrayed, that's going to teach you the knowledge, the esoteric knowledge that is the actual source of salvation in the Gnostic view. So these guys, um, like everybody else, uh, are condemned by people like Eusebius that we read before as, as heretics. So the, the folks who are going to win the Christian battles um, call the, all of these folks heretics. So Manny, what we know from the writings that we now have, um, he described visions that he had with what he calls his heavenly twin um, when he's 12 and then later when he's 24. And so there's a whole bunch of uh, history of this idea of, of twins where there's a divine twin and, a, and a, an immortal twin. So everybody from Castor and Pollux and, and Hercules and his twin brother. And um, another one of these that is common in Gnosticism and some of these early Christian movements and is specifically kind of important in the East is Jesus and Jesus's twin brother, um, Judas, who is called Judas Thomas. And Thomas is a word that just means the twin. And he's sometimes called Didymus, which is just Greek for twin. So Didymus, Judas, Thomas. Um, and so uh, the Eastern church here and Manny's church, especially Manny's religion, um, preserve uh, Christian non-canonical stuff that didn't make it into the um, New Testament, but is considered scripture by many um, acts of, for example, the apostle Thomas. And so Thomas here being Jesus's twin, Thomas is the apostle who goes out to India and converts people in India, according to um, essentially this legend, but it continues to be a tradition in the Indian, uh, among Indian Christians today. So uh, the twin here, this heavenly twin called Mayani to leave uh, the Elkisites so this Christian sect that he came from, and instead preach what now he's being given is the true gospel of Christ. And so uh, Manning then declares himself to be an apostle of Jesus, and he also proclaims that he's the paraclete, the comforter that Jesus said would come, and indeed that's because he's the last prophet. Um, this is a common theme <laughs> that we've had in the same way that um, people are always living in the latter days, you know, so you're always at the time when the world is about to end in the same way when you're a prophet, you're very often the last prophet because all of the other prophets have gone before you and you're now predicting um, that the end is about to happen. And so um, unlike uh, Jesus, who didn't leave any writings, Manny was a, quite a prolific writer. And so he has at least six major texts that were written in Aramaic. And then he also wrote at least one major text in Persian. And so the first of these uh, is the Evangelion. So the gospel, the, the Manichaean gospel, the gospel of Manny. He has a book called The Treasure of Life, another one called The Treatise, one called The Secrets, one called The Book of Giants, which is uh, an expansion of the uh, apocalyptic or apocryphal um, Book of Enoch, and so this is one of these. Um, there's a there's a little line in Genesis that says there were giants in the earth in those days, uh, and and that inspired a lot of uh, 
apocalyptic and apocryphal expansion. Uh, he has a Psalter, which is to say a, a whole book of Psalms and prayers for the Manichaeans. And then he wrote, like I say, in Persian, a book called the uh, Shahubragan, which is um, a book that was dedicated to the Sasanian Shah, so to the, uh, the Persian emperor when uh, the Parthian Empire is overthrown and the new dynasty, the new uh, Persian dynasty, the Sasanians uh, take over. Uh, Manny is trying to um, accomplish what uh, what occurs with Constantine, where Constantine is converted to Christianity and um, Christianity becomes the state religion of the Roman Empire um, by writing this book dedicated to the Persian, the new Persian Shah. Um, Manny's hopeful that uh, Manichaeism can become the state religion of the Persian Empire. So. What's this religion all about? It's some of it'll be seem a little familiar if you've if we've gone through before uh, both Gnosticism and we've talked about kind of some of these Gnostic texts and a little bit also um, there's some elements that are reminiscent also of Zoroastrianism. Um, as you remember from Gnostic texts, they often uh, describe a very elaborate uh, creation story. A cosmogony, this idea of how the universe um, is created, what's the origin of this universe, and this is in some ways a um, an attempt to explain why is life why is life filled with suffering, why is life unsatisfactory, why is there so much evil in the world, um, and so these origin stories, which kind of ultimately at the, have at their source their allegories for kind of philosophical consequences or uh, so like things like truth is born first and light, but then out of it uh, come things like intellect and wisdom and other other ideas. And so these are all kind of personified as deities in these uh, in these creation stories. And so Manny has one of these creation stories of his own. Um, so in his idea, uh, in his telling, the world resulted uh, from a battle between the primordial world of light and the primordial world of darkness. And so his scripture, um, in addition to this uh, long creation stories, also includes a very detailed pantheon. So, so there's not just one God, but all of these divinities and a pandemonium, uh, which is to say in the same, you have pantheon, which means all of the gods, right? And pandemonium, which is to mean pandemonium, which means all of the demons. So a, a group of um, the the good forces and the evil forces from the world of light and darkness. So this is a dualist religion. Um, dualism is one of the ways that people come up with the answer to the problem of evil. One of the reasons why there's evil is because their force of good is in a cosmic battle with, with evil, right? And so uh, Manny, as Manny tells it, there is a world of light and there's a world of darkness. The world of light is ruled by the father of greatness. And there are five uh, Shekinahs, which are the divine attributes of light uh, that are emerge from the father of greatness. And these are reason, mind, intelligence, thought, understanding. Uh, so you can kind of see the, the things that Manny is valuing here. <clears throat> and meanwhile, the world of darkness is ruled by the king of darkness. And then there are five evil kingdoms uh, that correspond materially to those uh, light Shekinahs that are representing the evil qualities then. <clears throat> so our world in part results from uh, this unexpected attack that the world of darkness made on the world of light. So one of the strengths of the world of light is that it's this peace, blissful, peaceful, self-sufficient, harmonious place. But it also had a weakness, which is that it really wasn't prepared for conflict. Meanwhile, the work of darkness has um, the weaknesses of being anarchic, chaotic, divided, and warring. But it also had a bunch of strengths, which are, <laughs> it's aggressive, powerful, and uh, it's also motivated by envy. And so therefore, um, they're fighting for something that they, they want. So there are three creations uh, in order, according to Manny, to get to where we are today. Um, there's a 
Manichaean diagram that was recovered, I think it's Central Asia that's illustrating this. The first creation is the father of greatness calls upon the mother of life to send the original man to fight darkness. Darkness ends up winning uh, by capturing the five shreds of light within demons, but then this is also in a way maybe a lure or a trick by the forces of light which have now mixed up uh, the negative stuff with the good stuff. So in other words, there's good in there uh, to overcome the bad. Then after that first creation, there's a second creation where the father calls upon the living spirit and his five sons to create a world from the bodies of the demons. So in other words, we're building it from that, <clears throat> from them. Ten heavens and eight earths are created from mixed matter. And so this is matter that has material stuff from the world of darkness, but it also has uh, light and energy, wisdom, spirit that is uh, captured in it. So the sun, the moon, the stars are created from light that's recovered from the world of darkness. Finally, then there's a third creation. Uh, evil beings devour light. They copulate and that produces... Adam and Eve, so the first human beings. Uh, the father then sends what's called the radiant Jesus to awaken Adam to reveal the true source of light trapped in his material body. And so um, there's many times when there are these moments of revelation uh, where different prophets, in this case Adam being the first prophet, uh, theoretically would have been able to uh, be awakened to this kind of truth. Um, but nevertheless, even armed with that knowledge, they still um, err. And so Adam and Eve copulate, they produce more human beings, and that action traps light in bodies of mankind throughout history. And so you can kind of see this kind of materialism where, um, or, or dualism where ma the material and the physical um, body and this kind of thing are bad light spirit knowledge those things are good and the good is trapped in the bad in the bodies and in this kind of dualism so um, according to manny there were numerous prophets who have come before him to reveal the same truth and because he's at the crossroads here and later than a lot of these other world religions um, different gods that are sorry, different forerunners that he reveals to have been prophets before him include the Buddha, Krishna, Zoroaster, and Jesus. So what he is doing here is not just, um, so in some ways Christianity is like an overt sequel to Judaism and Islam is another sequel to them both. Um, in this particular case, uh, Manichaeism is more synthetic where it's actually drawing across um, alien world traditions uh, and saying, yeah, those all went before and now um, they all have some truth in them, but I'm the successor to all of them. Uh, and so Manny then is the last of these prophets uh, and is therefore able to reveal to humanity the complete gospel. And it's good because the world is at the end of the world is about to happen as always. And so therefore um, he is there to uh, to predict that. So what can humans do about all of this? So humans can bring about cosmic and personal salvation through obedience to five rigorous commandments and a lifestyle that includes abstention from eating meat, from drinking alcohol, from earning their own living, and from sexual activity. So that's a lot to ask, you know, of anybody, um, especially the learning, earning your own living part. It's hard, as you can imagine, to to have a, a society, you know, if you're not having sex either, you're not, uh, this is one of the problems uh, where in world religions are, are, are not about, not the be fruitful and multiply types, but instead are they, let's not have kids types. That's another thing that sometimes causes the world religion to uh, go extinct. But anyway, it's not everybody that's that's able to to follow the most rigorous laws. But if you're able to live this high law, uh, this is purifies a human body, uh, and that body then is can liberate light, for example, that exists in vegetable matter through special rituals. And so essentially, you are both um, achieving your own salvation through this kind of very good behavior, 
uh, and anti-material behavior, and that's also uh, affecting the whole of cosmic salvation as you are liberating uh, light from matter. So, so how does it work? So because not everybody can follow these very aesthetic rules, um, the Manichaean community has to be divided into two groups. So on the one hand, we have the elect, and on the other hand, uh, we have the hearers. So the male and female monks who follow all of those strict rules, including not even being a part of participating in commercial activity, so their ascetics, um, they are the elect, and then the hearers are the lay people who are essentially taking part in and are um, able to be um, helping out this whole cosmic uh, activity because they are essentially giving alms and supporting uh, the group of monks and nuns here who are uh, who are able to live out the stricter laws, right? And so um, the hearers then are aiding in this cosmic salvation because they listen to the teachings and then they support materially the elect. The Manichaean church has a, a structure. Um, we even heard Eusebius talk about it a little bit in that he said that there's a leader at the top. They have He calls 12 apostles. The 12 apostles have under them 72 bishops. Behind them are 360 presbyters. Then there are all the other members of the elect, and then finally uh, the lay people, the body of all of the hearers who are supporting uh, all of these uh, elect uh, people living this ascetic life. So we can kind of see, as we are um, just even looking at Man Manichaeism, I mean, that's just a thumbnail, so it's just a very... Uh, limited picture that we're having, that there's actually lots and lots of influences that have uh, made their way into the religion from Judaism and Christianity, Gnosticism, Zoroastrianism, Buddhism, maybe other Indian religions, and maybe also um, traditions from na natively there in Mesopotamia, which is where Manny is born. So although paganism was very much on the, on the wane at this point, um, there was still maybe some pagan Mesopotamian influences on Manny. Um, he's from there and uh, he called himself the doctor of Babylon, although um, these Mesopotamian influences seem minor. Um, some elements, for example, make their way into Manny's uh, scripture, his mythology, his cosmology. So for example, as he's telling um, stories, uh, uh, he's got a guy named Atumbis who is like Utnapishtim from the Epic of Gilgamesh, so this really um, ancient uh, uh, story that is still, you know, kind of retold, and now it, it makes its way into Manichaeism in the same th same way from that Epic of Gilgamesh, uh, the the monster Umbaba, you know, it becomes Hubabes in in Manny's uh, scripture. Uh, in terms of Jewish influence, um, we've already talked about, like for example, Adam and Eve. So there's things that are making their way, uh, ultimately tracing back to uh, ancient Judaism, because Manny does have Jewish scripture as part of his canon, um, and it's both um, the Hebrew Bible as as we have it, but also includes a lot of other uh, later Jewish apocalyptic writings. I mentioned the Book of Enoch. Um, that that also didn't make it into anybody's canon, but is um, part of Manichaean ideas. Manichaean cosmology, and then in the creation story, is informed by the Hebrew Bible and Genesis. Um, but the influence here is probably indirect, so he's probably not drawing directly from rabbinic Judaism, and instead it's this Judaizing Christian sect that his father raised him in, that um, is where he's kind of Anyway, the indirectly getting these Jewish influences. The Christian influences um, are substantial, but it's obviously his religion is a, um, a break from preceding uh, understandings of Christianity or mainline Christianity and a fusion into a new world religion. And so the role, for example, of Jesus Christ uh, is still substantial in um, Manichaeism, uh, but Jesus, for example, is seen as divine and not fully human, and so it was just an illusion that he was human. Uh, they also, Manichaeanism, uh, retains this cosmological idea of a savior, 
uh, but it's transferred to the primordial first man who sacrifices himself to save the world of light. Um, in general, so we saw about there being apostles and bishops and presbyters, and so the organization of Manichaeism uh, imitates Christian organization. There's lots of Gnostic influences, as we kind of saw. Um, their Gnosticism had continued to be um, practiced and understood and written about in, in the Syrian, Aramaic, and uh, East. And, um, and obviously that influenced Manny a lot in, as he was working out this very complex dualist cosmogony and mythology. Um, just like uh, the Gnostics also had this division of the world into the elect and the hearers. So you would have had, again, with Gnostics, a, um, a group that are able to practice it and other people who are not part of that. And both of them um, are dualist in this way and are wanting to um, liberate light, which is equated with knowledge and things like that. Uh, Manichees, however, um, see matter as mixed with good and evil, um, whereas Gnostics, Gnostics is hard to get a, a thumbnail on them because there was a lot of variation. It's generally speaking, uh, matter is, is more all evil in Gnosticism. Um, and they also seek to liberate light through this ritual so that they're doing not simply through esoteric knowledge. So it's got some of the Gnostic ideas, but it's not exactly Gnosticism. Uh, it does have a bunch of Zoroastrian influence into it. So for example, both of these religions, Zoroastrianism and Manichaeism are dualist. Uh, they have primordial worlds of light and darkness. Um, Manichaeism gets to be a little syncretic. So when it gets translated into the different languages. So when it goes from Syriac and Aramaic into Persian, um, the Mani lines up all of the names for the Manichaean divinities so that they match with the Zoroastrian pantheon and the pandemonium in Zoroastrianism. Um, and that tends to be true wherever Manichaeism goes. And so it's uh, it tends to uh, be syncretic and so it also is working on essentially co-opting and saying you know like you're saying Zoroaster is somebody who was a prophet who came before me this is kind of the the culmination of Zoroastrianism it's not that you guys are all wrong but it's that we have new prophecy kind of thing um, the same argument is being made that the Manichees are making to Christians uh, and so on and Buddhists so in Zoroastrianism the creation is a good divine act uh, for Manichaeism it's kind of a mixed good and evil uh, thing. Buddhist influences. This is always interesting for folks in our group. They're always interested when we have these um, connections between India across through Persia and into the West, if possible. And so Mani lived for a time on the kind of frontier between uh, Persia and India. And indeed, there's a, um, uh, a Indian... Um, an Indian kingdom that's on the other side that uh, is in a lot of contact with the uh, the Persians at this time. And so he's exposed to Indian religions, and he definitely, for example, even cites the Buddha as uh, one of the forerunners as far as he's concerned in his religion. So one of the things that Manichaeism actually uh, adopts or that comes more from Buddhism than certainly from Zoroastrianism or or Christianity is the idea of the transmigration of souls, so reincarnation. And so that becomes uh, a part of Manichaeism. Um, and when we talked before about this structure of the fact that there's elect, this group of monks that are at the center of the religion, and then everybody else who kind of is supporting the monks, that is very um, much more similar, for example, to how uh, the Buddhist community operates where the Buddhist monks are kind of at the center of the community and everyone kind of is supporting them, but not everybody can be a monk. So in that kind of way, um, that similarity may be even being drawn from, from Buddhism. There may well be other um, Indian influences. So the Manichaean idea of a suffering world soul, there's some similarities between that and Jainism. And Manichaeans and Jains share the idea of avoiding causing injury and also by being vegetarian. Um, however, even though there's some, some interesting things there, Manny doesn't actually list uh, the Mahavira, the great promoter of Jainism as a forerunner. So how much influence he, 
that his or how much direct contact he has, it's not necessarily clear. So in sum, uh, Manichaeism, um, although it's viewed uh, by everybody who isn't a Manichae as this great uh, source of dangerous heresy and error from uh, China to uh, the Latin West and Islam in between, nevertheless, um, it was a, a world religion that has Gnostic and Christian roots with a big dose of Zoroastrianism and some Buddhism. Uh, it had a large core of scripture, a church hierarchy with a prophetic leader, and it pretty quickly spread over vast distances uh, because of its missionary structure and missionary um, focus. And so I mentioned that at Manny's birth, Tessaphon was the capital of the Parthian Empire, but in his childhood, the Parthians were overthrown and Tessaphon became the capital of the Sasanian Empire. And so he's uh, kind of there in the middle and sending missionaries off in, in both directions, uh, east and west. So the Sasanians, when they um, took over Persia, they presented themselves as a revival of that ancient Persian empire that Alexander had overthrown, the Achaemenid Empire. Uh, and so because essentially they're suggesting that everybody uh, in between has been a foreign occupier. So these Greek kings and later these Iranian nomads, the Parthians. Um, now um, what the Sassanids are wanting to do is to revive um, uh, the old Persian ideas. And so ultimately, they're going to end up reviving Zoroastrianism, which had been the religion of the ancient Persian Empire, as their um, state religion. But initially, um, it was possible that, or Manny anyway, hoped it was possible that Manichaeism could have been the one that wins out. So Manny, as I said, dedicated his last major book, which he wrote in Persian, to the Sasanian Shah, Shapur I. And although Shopper didn't convert, he tolerated Manny and Manichaeism. However, um, when his son took over and became Shah, Bahram I, he became a, quite a zealous Zoroastrian. And so um, Bahram imprisoned Manny, and while he was waiting to be executed, or possibly he died in prison, anyway, Manny uh, dies uh, in, the, in the keeping then of uh, the emperor, the second Shah. And, um, and ultimately then the Manichaeans within the Sasanian Empire are persecuted as the uh, Zoroastrianism becomes the uh, dominant religion of the empire. So there's kind of a formula for world religions uh, when they're gonna win. <laughs> so, so and, and that tends to be when you get state uh, partnership, when you get uh, state sponsorship and support. So Buddhism early on uh, was promoted by Ashoka of the Mauryan Empire in India and later uh, by Southeast Asian and Central Asian states, including the Mongols under Kublai Khan. So um, Buddhism spread uh, with those kinds of state support. Christianity's um, triumph in the Greek East and the Latin West came because of uh, the, the religion becoming the state religion of the Roman Empire. And Zoroastrianism, um, when it was large and dominant, it was because it was the state religion of the Persian Empire. And ultimately, really, Islam was the state religion of the Muslim Caliphate and then also many successor Muslim states to this day. Um, so Manichaeism didn't win <laughs> in terms of taking over uh, either the Roman Empire or uh, uh, the, the Sassanid Empire, the Persian Empire, uh, but it did get a second chance. And so uh, in, the ninth, uh, in the 8th and 9th century, um, one of the um, Central Asians, so one of the nomadic Turkic states, uh, the Uyghurs, and so if you may be aware of the Uyghurs right now, because they are the, uh, the uh, population group that live in in Xinjiang, which is this area that's controlled by 
uh, China and all of the Uyghurs are being put in in uh, concentration camps, like a million of them in, in in China right now, as they're trying as the Chinese are trying to, uh, el you know, eliminate them as an independent uh, group at this point. But at a in the in the eight hundreds and the nine hundreds, uh, as you can kind of see on the map here, uh, the Uyghur Khaganate was a large uh, uh, confederation of um, nomads. Uh, that controlled kind of a big area of the steppe. And in 763, the Uyghur Kagan Boku Tekin converted to Manichaeism. And at that point then, Manichaeism became um, the state religion of the Uyghur Kaganate. Uh, but unfortunately the Uyghur, for, for Manichaeism, that only lasted until 840, but it gave it a big shot in the arm and that spread it around again and so they were able to um, move out of uh, where they had been being persecuted in the Middle East which is now going to have become uh, a Muslim area uh, to Central Asia um, as kind of a new new capital. So uh, ultimately um, the Mongols take over the whole thing and, and so on and so forth. And, and Turk, uh, the Turks and ultimately the Uyghurs um, are converted ultimately to Islam. And so the last kind of holdouts of Manichaeism um, were in China all the way up into the 14th century. Uh, and those guys were suppressed by Ming rulers after the years 1370. And so there's only one surviving Manichaean temple and it survives in Xinjiang, which is uh, on the southeast coast of China, opposite Taiwan. And the temple there, the Manichaean temple, uh, survived by just becoming a Buddhist temple. And there's a statue of Mani there that has been viewed as the Buddha. And so it's called the Buddha of Light. And so this is the last um, kind of surviving holdout shrine. Although obviously the people there are Buddhists. They don't remember. They don't. They're not. They haven't maintained being Manichaeism, Manichae, but the temple and the and the statue maintained themselves by uh, by becoming Buddhist. And so uh, Manichaeism from having lots of promising beginnings from spreading from everywhere across from France to China uh, ultimately uh, did not win. Ultimately, it went extinct. And so that's my uh, survey brief, though it has to be of the rise and fall of Manichaeism. Uh, the world religion that lost. And so um, I guess we'll ask if we are having questions or comments. You, you should ask the questions I'll ask, first off, that I'll ask all of you who've been joining us. Um, have you even heard of Manichees? <laughs> I mean, what is, or what, did you find this, uh, this interesting? Uh, what are you, um, what are your thoughts about uh, just, I guess, the survival of world religions and future of all of this and uh, anything else that you found interesting about this. Okay. Yes, so um, you're right. So depending on which book, we talked, somebody's writing me to clarify that the Ethiopian and Eritrean churches consider the book of Enoch canonical, and that's correct, depending on which book of Enoch it is. And so I'm not I'm not actually I'm not actually remembering which book of Enoch it is, but you're correct. I said that the book of Enoch uh, was not in anybody's canon, but it is actually, like you say, it is in the Ethiopian and Eritrean churches that um, it's canonical. So thank you very much. Um, it sounded like women and men were in the elect. Um, how involved were women able to be in leadership? Um, so I think it's a situation that's like. Uh, it's a situation that sort of like happens in, in Buddhism, right? Where uh, because the, um, the center of the, um, the worship and community is uh, this community of monks and nuns, uh, and they are both living, in this case for Manichees, they're living a, a fully celibate life. And so you've stepped out of the role of being male or female at that point. Um, and so I'm not... Um, so I'm not aware. I don't know that that means that they can that women were able to be bishops of the uh, in the Manichaean community or apostles. But what it does mean is that um, women were able to be um, at the center of that elect, which is would have been the center of the the worshiping community in the experience that anybody would have had on a local level. 
Leon uh, DeBerg asks, is there any record um, of Manny meeting important Christian church leadership and having debates and stuff? Um, so I don't think that there is that I'm aware of. So I don't think that um, it's not that Manny, so Manny did go to the East and he was um, uh, encountering therefore um, uh, like some of the Indian traditions, Buddhism, um, but yeah, it would, been a, it would be interesting if, you know, he would have, you know, come and had a debate with, let's say, whoever would have existed at that kind of, you know, early second time century, whenever, or the, d during his time frame, the going, gone to the patriarch of, of Alexandria and challenged him to a debate or something. Um, so no, I don't have, I don't, I don't, not aware of any, any story like that. Um, definitely, uh, that kind of argument is had between Manichaeans and Christians later, um, for example, in Augustine's time, but it's not, uh, but it's not directly between the, the founder of the religion and, and an important patriarch. Uh, Elizabeth writes, Elaine Pagels in the Gnostic Gospel says, <clears throat> the Gnostic Gospel says, Gnosticism didn't prevail because it was the preserve of a learned minority. And it looks the same could be true that Manichaeism, in other words, there's a small learned mystical elite and lots of obedient followers but what must have appealed and still does is the division of the world into good and evil holmes morty harry potter and voldemort You're not supposed to say that voldemort <laughs> Anyways, but anyway yes um well so i guess that can be true so i think that that's true more for gnostics than maybe manichaeans because gnostics um like you say were just a religion of the elite and their religion was secret and so they were actually uh, looking down on everybody who wasn't in the elite and they were a secret elite and they were uh, they were hanging out and doing that all by themselves. Uh, I think for the for Manichaeism, um, this would have worked more like how Buddhism works and Buddhism has survived, which is to say you have you have a focus on what's functionally what we would think of as being like a monastic community. So the elector like the monks uh, and everybody else is, um, you know, is giving alms and things like that to the to the monks so that they're able to, you know, do all of this work of praying for you and also um, liberating light, you know, so you're doing all of this important cosmic uh, work that you're part of because um, people are being monks and doing that. And it also can be the kind of case where, um, and this would happen in the in the Christian West too, which at a certain point, like a, a count or a knight or anybody, um, when they get too old to to fight anymore anyway they would maybe retire and they'd go off and live in a monastery certainly the um, widows uh, of of kings and queens and things like that you know widows of uh, kings would go and do that and so you could in other words you could put on the monastic habit later in life and so you could do that as well with manichaeism when you were old enough and ready to kind of uh, give up eating meat and drinking alcohol and having sex and things okay so, but Elizabeth says, what makes a religion attractive to rulers to make it their state religion? <laughs> That's a good, good question. That's a good point. Um, I guess in this case, uh, dedicating a book of scripture to the ruler wasn't enough. <laughs> so that was certainly, um, uh, Manny was kind of pulling that out. He's an author and a writer, and he was prepared to um, try to, uh, try to use that uh, tool. Uh, one of the reasons why um, uh, why we've had lectures on this before. How, why did Christianity beat out um, paganism, especially in ages like like the Viking era, where you think that um, these kind of warrior gods like uh, Thor and and Odin and everybody are going to um, uh, who are having all of these strong warriors, you know, promising them if they kill everybody, they're going to go to Valhalla, and and you're having that up against this god that's uh, Prince of Peace and and all of these things. Why why how does the how does the warrior um, uh, religion not win in in uh, in the in the Viking era? You know, and and the answer we kind of saw about it is is that um, Christianity ends up being a very strong um, advocate of monarchy. So the bishops are just really um, interested in in working with kings and getting and elevating kings and kings have all of this divine authority because they are anointed by the bishops and they're able to um, speak as kind of God's representative uh, for their kingdom. And so as a result of it, it was a, um, 
it was a very powerful tool that the kings were able to have to take control of a whole what becomes a state that emerges out of it and so out of just kind of tribal confederations that the vikings are running around and you actually have stable um, monarchies and kingdoms that emerge and so um, so i'd say christianity's uh, support in the middle ages anyway of hierarchy um, was one of the reasons why it was a, um, a popular state religion for for kings anyway especially wanda mercer writes I had not heard of this before. <laughs> well, I, that's all right. I mean, I totally understand. This was sometimes we do um, lectures on current events and things that are uh, very familiar to everybody. Sometimes we dip a little bit into uh, what's somewhat more obscure topics, but I, some, I think that they're always meant to have um, some relevance for us thinking about things today. In this case, thinking about world religions and how they live and uh, spread and that sort of thing. Barbara Crompton writes, I first heard of Manichaeism from uh, St. Augustine in, in the, his confessions. So yes, yeah, so that would be one of the ways that the Manichaeans continue to be remembered in the West especially, uh, is through all of the discussion uh, that St. Augustine had uh, on this topic. Teresa uh, uh, Maglioka says, I had not heard of this before, but it's very interesting. Thank you for the great preparation. You're very, very welcome. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Leslie Brooks said, nope, I've never heard of Manichaeism. <laughs> so a lot of you had not heard of this, which is, that's fine. Bruce Nelson said, I lived in uh, Hamandan for a while, so I found this very fascinating. Uh, that's very cool. That's very interesting. Uh, Angel Elements said, given Manichaeism's syncretism, uh, why was everybody so keen on persecuting them? So I think that um, part of the reason probably is that they uh, are maybe too similar. And so you're not identifying them so much as being uh, completely foreign, but rather um, as being something that's like your religion and therefore um, even more dangerous. And so if Manichees are running around the Christian Roman Empire and saying, oh no, you know, we, we totally, you know, we believe in Adam and Eve and Jesus Christ and all these things, but there's been another prophet. So Jesus promised that he would send a paraclete. That paraclete uh, was the prophet Manny, and he has an additional gospel. Um, then that's like a lot more dangerous than if it's just, you know, they're talking about uh, Muhammad and, and and really that didn't appeal to, I mean, the Christians, I mean, people, people did convert when they got conquered and things like that in terms of Islam, but it's a different enough that uh, Manichaeism is maybe uh, slipping in too much. You know, it's talking too much to the Zoroastrians and saying, yeah, Zoroaster, he was a prophet. The Buddha was a prophet. You know, he's a forerunner of Mani. And so I think that um, having that uh, uh argument that they that this is a a religion that supersedes your religion that, that it, it um that we're the truer or more restored or the final uh gospel um was maybe seen as more dangerous by all of the rivals uh ron wagner says nope never heard of this before very interesting uh Corey bell says i had heard of them but i knew basically nothing about them so hopefully this has all been um interesting new information for almost everybody here. Um, people are also asking if there's a book um, about the topic. And so there's certainly, yeah, there's um, the primary sources for sure. Um, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to look up a book, uh, you know, look up some books that I think, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm, I, there are books, but I'm not prepared to recommend any as one that is like a favorite book that I like. So uh, we'll have to look up and do some reviews of uh of books so that we can put them into the links here for for later reading but thank you so much for all of these comments and and questions and um Let me see if there's something else. oh there may be more <laughs> so uh, but i'm gonna take a drink of water here and i can see if i can do it just with one hand no wait two hands just kidding <laughs> Okay. Oh, Wanda. Wanda Mercer writes, I did have a course of 
uh, new religions that birthed in the burned over region of New York uh, in early 1800, including Mormonism. And some of these, like the Shakers, promoted no sex and thus died out. Uh, the practice is self-defeating. <laughs> so, so yeah, if you're um, if you're wanting to start a new religion and you and you want to make sure it lasts more than a couple generations, you know, um, that's one of the doctrines you probably want to you know stick clear of is telling people not to have sex, right? So yes, and so uh, the Shakers, there's very if there's if there are a couple of them left or that they die out entirely. Um, so she thinks of especially Mormons and Catholics who promoted no birth control and thus had a high birth rate and growing populations. Um, although that's uh, settled down more from where it had been, but yeah, sure. If you are, uh, if the commandment that God gives you is be fruitful and multiply and inherit the earth, um, and the other people's God tells them, yeah, don't have sex. That's bad. Cause you're trapping, um, uh, light energy in, um, you know, base matter. And what we want to do is, is liberate all the light energy and not to keep doing that. Um, it's like you say, in terms of propagation of the idea, it's, it's harder to do it anyway, through natural propagation, you have to convert people every, every generation. Um, Leandra asks, did Manichaeism develop a monastic tradition similar to Buddhism and Christianity as a way of dividing expectations for the elect and the rest of the community? Um, similar to some form of Buddhism where the community benefits by supporting the monks and nuns who don't work and don't have kids, etc. Yes, exactly. And so, you know, that would have, so this thing we're talking about, about not having kids. So Christian monks and nuns, generally also, they weren't supposed to be having kids anyway when they were in the abbeys and, and the monasteries. And, and we don't think of it as much anymore, but throughout all of antiquity and the Middle Ages, um, monks and nuns was, were pretty much the central focus of, of Christianity and Christian and worship. And so those, again, are people who are living in this kind of liminal place. They're between, you know, the world of everyday life, the farm, essentially what everybody's doing is farming. And so they're between your, uh, this kind of uh, physical worldly grind now and the eternal realm because they are uh, set apart from it. They're doing things that are different. They're not, they're abstaining um, from different types of food or insects or whatever they're, whatever they're doing. And they're spending all their time praying or, uh, you know, the different uh, living according to very strict rules. And so as a result of that, um, the community is able to um, participate in that bridge that the monks and the nuns are making between the divine realm and your everyday realm. And so, so in that sense, I mean, we think of this, it seems very alien, but it's, it's actually pretty similar to what Christianity was kind of configured like throughout anyway, the middle ages and what Buddhism is sort of configured like, you know, to this day. So, so yes, very much so. All right. Well, very good. Um, I'm going to look up uh, and see if we can't put a book recommendation in the links uh, in the next day or so. But I really appreciate uh, you guys tuning in for a topic that is a little obscure, but hopefully uh, you found interesting. And so speaking um, like uh, Wanda was talking about, we'll turn um, next week to that burned over district and we'll look at the origins and early history of the Latter-day Saint movement. See you then.